allow the group that was trying to promote what I was doing to have access. They were stymied, they didn't know what to do. And I said, well, you know, when I was a young activist, I mean, we didn't have computers, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have email, and we didn't have Facebook pages. So we had a phone tree, and we actually called people up on the phone, and we had graffiti and wheat pasting and physical flyers that we handed out or posted around town. And that's what we did. You can still do that. And, and in a way, I think it's a mistake not to continue those skills. We have silk screeners over here. You know, that should be um, a, a ubiquitous talent that every actor and every affinity group should have their silk screener, their mass media creator. Because with very low money, you can create huge numbers of images using silk screeners. And if you really get good at it, you can get good at four color stuff where you do art, but it has a political message. And you can also raise money doing that. So, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do with the old technologies too. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with the new technology. I'm not very good at them, but I'm fine with them. But I think they have their place and their limits. And I don't think it's a good idea to replace them wholesale with the old style stuff. And I don't think we can do without face-to-face -face meetings. But the face-to-face -face meetings primarily should be this size group of people who, who want it. So answer your question. I was starting to say that affinity groups are amoebas, okay? So let's say you're in Brooklyn and you're in an apartment, and right now the only people you know that might want to form an affinity group are in other apartments blocks away. So you're fairly dispersed. It, 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 so at the very least, what I would say is start having dinner once a week. Same night every week. Maybe it rotates houses, but you do Wednesday night dinner, and it's potluck, or you rotate cooking, or whatever you do. And you just meet together and have dinner together and, and just do that. Get that regular. Okay? And then you define your purpose, you find your values, your common values. And so let's say one of your common values is sort of like environmental sustainability, and you really want the opinion group to be like sort of in the same house. But that's not gonna happen right away. So but maybe some people can actually do that. Maybe you can have a roommate, somebody roommate moves out, one of the people in your opinion group can move in. You can see how I'm growing organically, okay? But also, let's say you actually make an effort to meet your downstairs neighbor. Okay, because they, you happen to bump into them once you saw they were reading you know, a book that's radical or something, right? So you mentioned you have an affinity group meeting. Would you like to come to dinner and meet my group? Okay, and they come. So now you have two people in your building. You see where I'm saying? I see where you're going. So, so you keep doing that. Radicalize and our building. And, 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 the, and the affinity group is growing. So it starts with five people, it grows to 10 or 15, and at that point it splits along geographic lines. That people live closer together form one. It doesn't have to do that, but it, because the value is environmental sustainability, that makes sense. And you still work pretty closely together, but now you're two affinity groups having two different dinners, or maybe, and then maybe once a month you have a common dinner. See where I'm going with that? And you just keep growing and splitting like that, growing from the inside and, and living out your values, making the affinity group come closer and closer to the true values you're living, of cooperation, shared economies, defending each other when you're being attacked by the overculture, things like that, which has to be kind of more regular contact more holistic, being able to do the social technologies that I'm talking about, like being able to have a, what, what, there's actually this thing that the Heathrow community developed, which is an Heathrow check-in, which is what you can imagine a check-in is like, only it's structured and it goes way deep. It's the, the commitment that you can't say no to somebody who wants to check-in with you. I have a problem with you, let's work it out. And you can't walk away. And people do, of course, but that's not the commitment. You make women in your affinity group. If I have an issue with you, you will hang in there with me and work it out. And you what if stay. the person does it? Then you separate. You're not in the same affinity group. You're not. It's not a good. It's not a good match. But if you're an intentional community, well, and you keep trying to check in with somebody, and they will turn around and leave the room yep. when you say, "I need to check in with you now," and they leave the room, and, we, and the, the rest of the intentional community. Stands back, hands off, and watches this happen. Okay, well, that just happened to Ren and I. So you're talking about something very personal. Ren lived in Heathcote for 15 years. I lived there for six months, and we left. It happened that, with my son, and he left the community right. because he kept checking in with this one guy who refused to communicate with him. Right. Finally, he said, "Then I have to leave." The, you know, and, the, and the, the irony won't help me with right. this. And the irony of Heathcote is that when you join Heathcote, you sign a conflict resolution contract, which says that you will engage in the conflict resolution. Right. But then they didn't uphold it, and the less community elected will not uphold it, and so rather than fight them, we left. It's sad because it it's like sad. having to leave your family. Right, no, it is. So, so we're going to start a new community, and we're more, we're Ren and I are now both much more skilled at teaching this than ever either one of us. When I mean, we have 45 years of experience between us, but the last two years we have amplified it hugely.
tried to share that the past six months. It didn't go very well, but we're not giving up and things are happening. I, I told you earlier that this got the opportunity on Staten Island with the public school. But hey, you know, if the radical left doesn't want to hear what I have to say, I'll go to the public school. That's, that's pretty radical. I'm happy with that. So you see where I'm going with that? It's, it's both the idea of, and, and, and when I was in Chico, we were there, and I was talking about the students' model. I said, I, and I also mentioned, you may have heard me say, it's kind of a theatrical thing, like a theater piece to it. And in the theater of the oppressed, what I guess it's called nowadays, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know exactly what that means. But in the old days, it, 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 it's, um, you know, the living theater, Julian Beck, whose grandson I helped raise, and I know these people pretty deeply. Um, the idea was is that you, you don't take one of the ways I express this, you don't take no for an answer from life. You have something you want to do. And when the obvious way to do it doesn't seem to work out, you don't say you, you continue working it, continue looking at it. So one kind of example was the early days of food not bombs, when we'd be going to institutions, as we got as we got all the mom and pop grocery stores and little cafes like everything, you know, the, the food to off. Once we were already getting all their food. And that was a lot, we were already distributing it. And then we started going to a little bit larger operations, like, you know, there were big universities, Harvard and MIT, in Cambridge. Each one of them had 10 cafeterias. Each one of those cafeterias wasted tons of food, okay? Much of what we didn't want. But we wanted to break into that because we were ready for that. And immediately, the unions refused to cooperate with us. Bad idea, right? But we didn't give up. We started organizing, teaching. And the goal was to get them to understand that in fact, this actually helped their members when they went out on strike, because we fed them when they went out on strike. And that's what we were doing. And we had to educate them about that. But once they actually got that, then they understood, then, then they had the legitimate concern, they didn't want there to be more work for their workers without additional pay, okay? So we worked around that issue, because that was a legitimate issue we didn't want to do either. You know, and, and ultimately, we never finished that negotiation before but that particular group fell apart. I stopped doing it for a while. And when I came back, Hold on, story. Anyway, that kind of not uh, looking at a situation and not taking a personal thing. Looking at you've got a group of friends who want to form a community, but you're all spread out. Oh, must to make oh. ten minutes. Ten minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, I did too. Tell Dave to call me. Okay, yeah. So we can yes, get together his house. Okay, Ruth. I wanted this. Oh, cool. They're $30 for both of them? $150, the other $20. Uh, we're going to get cash out. Um, there's ATM machines right across the street. Okay. And um, there's other ones around. <laughs> 3 o'clock. Go to work at 3 o'clock. Unless somebody wants to pay me to not go to work. It's pretty cheap, actually. It's easy. <laughs> use, use the word linear. Non linear. Okay. Linear or non linear. Right. How do you define those two in terms of these concepts? Yeah, yeah. Concept. yeah, yeah. Um, linear structure and process, like techniques, are ones where um, it's really easy to see the steps. You start here, you do this, 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 and there. So much of what most meetings are like are meant to be linear. Okay, you have a certain group discussion technique like everybody gets two minutes and you go around the circle and you can speak for two minutes for 30 seconds. Right? That's very linear. In terms of process, that's very linear. That's very clear. A non-linear process would be saying random word association, just shout out when you have a word. So it bounces around the room, it bounces around the concepts. Um, and so in my model, there's different times when structure to be linear and there's other times when structure to be non-linear because different people function under different systems. They have different learning styles, they have different expression styles, and they have different brain styles. This is about studying the brain that I know. So for some people, being allowed to be non-linear is like a breath of fresh air. That makes a lot of sense to them. And at a gut level, not a sense of logic level, at a gut level, they feel it, and it feels comfortable. Other people, that feels like the worst possible thing to live through is allowing people to be non-linear. But both are legitimate. And, and but we have a society, an overculture that highly values the linear process, overvalues it. And so there's a denigration or a devaluing of non-linear processes. And one of our work is to not devalue linear processes. In fact, we're very strong about them. We believe in a very strong process. 
but we also believe in allowing time for the non-linear within that process. And, and to that point, we are very clear that when people have an emotive experience in a meeting, rather than treating that as something that shouldn't have happened, even with the, even with the words of, can we help you, can we make it better? Because that says it shouldn't have happened. If you think about it, so just being nice to a person when they have an emotive experience is not good enough. That does not create a safe space. What you really want to do is create an environment where you say, exactly, but let's not, let's not stop with the immediate reaction. Let's take a moment and really absorb what just happened. For everybody in the room, how you responded to that. That person just shouted, and another person got hurt. How do you feel about that? Well, that matters to the group dynamic. You can't do that in a linear way. So what you do is you, break, you stop the meeting, you break everybody up into diet, one minute each. Just anything on top of your mind. How do you feel right in this moment to the person next to you? A check-in. Check-in, right, that's a check-in, right. One minute, okay, time's up, now the other person speaks for a minute. Okay, time's up, let's get back to our meeting. That's enough to honor that explosive moment. It could have been that somebody connected to a hurt feeling. You know, oh my, you know, they just break down because like, I almost did this discussion when I realized, you know, these things touch us really deeply suddenly. Not to say a negative thing, but somebody has a, you know, they're giving up a talk or report and suddenly it touches them and they emote. You know, usually we just kind of get silent for a little bit, everybody's uncomfortable, and then we go right back to the meeting. And that does not honor that moment. That's real and it's valuable to stop and say, yes, that's real. That's the way human beings are. Let's incorporate that into our meeting because it came up in this meeting. It has something to do with this meeting, something valuable. We may not understand it. It doesn't matter. So that's the kind of work we're trying to do. So, so, so we might say it's value in the feminine, if you will, over the masculine. But I don't want to say that.